Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for this deep dive of Francis Lawrence's 2005 neo-noir supernatural thriller, Constantine. Or, for the Brits, Constantine. Oh, yeah, I mean, this is another Keanu movie, which I'm kind of a sucker for, so yeah. um, I'm, gl- I'm glad we picked this one. It was Yeah, this is a Dave movie. I'd never seen it before. We were looking for something, looking at our popular episodes, and kind of our, our number one and number two are Bill and Ted and The Crow, and this kind of fits in between them. It's a comic book, dark anti-hero in a trench coat, and it's Keanu Reeves. Yeah, and I mean... Uh, we didn't really plan when we were going to talk about this, but we were fishing for a really nice standalone episode for mm-hmm. this one, which is going to be our episode 49. Right. Because we're going to be doing a big um, kind of a format shift, uh, f- starting with episode 50. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, I was going to save it for the news, but we can we can talk about that now. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Dave has been impressing on me for a little while now. Episode 50 is coming up. We have to do something special. Something cool. Yeah, because I feel like we're at this point when you when you put out fifty episodes, you're like you're a real boy. Yeah, <laughs> we we're actually doing this. It's not just an experiment anymore. It's just become a, a thing we do. Yeah, um, and so you might call it a lifestyle decision. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> podcasting is a lifestyle yeah for sure <laughs> um and so we we knocked around a few ideas and we were kind of thinking about doing like a, a special double episode and and you know kind of or trying like to a few movies for one like, yeah but those become like those become unwieldy very cumbersome and they and, stop and they stop being a deep dive yeah then it gets how can we brush through this many quickly yeah and so we came up with the idea uh, moving forward, that we're going to start doing themed series. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, start it off with a cyberpunk series. Yeah, because it's the most uh, inherently meta trifecta genre that we could think of. Yeah. So when we say series, we basically mean we're gonna we're gonna take a bunch of movies that are in a theme, mm-hmm. and we're gonna go through you know top five, top ten, or whatever. We're gonna have we're gonna have a set amount. We're not gonna make it locked in for every series. Right. It could shift a bit, but the idea is to do a series of episodes that are all um, linked by genre or something like a specific director or yeah. whatever, so that there's some uh, cohesion there. Yeah, and so this episode today is your. It dropped on I think the first of July. Mm-hmm. We're gonna take the rest of July off because we've got some traveling to do, and then we will be be back uh, on August first with episode fifty, and it'll be episode one of our cyberpunk series. Yeah, so this will be our first uh, intentionally missed uh, drop date. Um, and that's that's all right. We did miss one by a day or something like that before, but that's no big deal. We have we've had a couple come out on the day um, that we recorded it that day. Yeah, yeah. like I think the the day that you were snowed in, I drove over here, had to dig my way out of your driveway, but we rec- we managed to get an episode done. Yeah, so we're gonna be skipping our our July fifteenth drop, and uh, we'll be back just like he said on August 1st with episode 50 which is episode 1 of the Cyberpunk series. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um if you have ideas for series that you'd like to see, go ahead and add us on Twitter mm-hmm. um or or respond to any of our socials posts when this episode drops with uh ideas for series. Um I I want to stay away from just doing movies and their uh infinite sequels like Avengers or whatever. Right. Yeah. But but cool things, sometimes sometimes there might be a few in there that are that are sequels, but more like a theme, less like a series. Yeah. Even though we're calling it a series. It's yeah. a series of movies. It's a series like in the way that uh, seasons of British television are called series exactly. instead of seasons. It just sounds a little a little classier that way. Yeah, and season doesn't really fit what we're doing here. Totally. Um, all right. So, I mean, that's that's a really good uh, really bu- good kind of segue into, into the news. And we can hit the... Or did you have some more deets on Constantine that you'd like to drop? Oh, no. We can save that for when we get into it. But should, right. we, should we roll for initiative? Yeah, let's roll for initiative. Okay. Eight. 
Ooh, just barely ahead of you with a nine. Ooh, nice. Okay, so first up, Kit Harrington is attached to reprise his role as Jon Snow. That was my number one news item. I figured it would be. <laughs> <laughs> um, because HBO, bereft of ideas, is developing a, a sequel to Game of Thrones. And old Georgie is all for it. He's two thumbs up on this idea. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's, uh, well, it's, I mean, it's, another, it's more passive income for him. Well, I think at this point, because he's never inflated his lifestyle, like he still lives in his house in New Mexico, mm-hmm. right? He, he's got more than enough money. Yeah. I just think he likes the idea of exploring that territory and letting it happen. You know? And he usually writes a couple episodes and like... He's consults and yeah, all that. Yeah, he's involved in this stuff, and so it'll have his fingerprints on it a bit. Hopefully, um, <laughs> we got a little kitty cat. Yeah, going excuse on. the cats. Um, hopefully, more than that final season of Game of Thrones. Yeah, that one was really bad. But one th- thing that really kind of um, interests me, like when I started looking into this piece of news, mm-hmm. um, we've got so many things in development. House of the Dragon is about to drop, which right. is about the Targaryen conquest. Um, there's one called this, uh, Nine Voyages, which is in development, has a showrunner, the whole deal. And uh-huh. it's called, it's called Nine Voyages. And it's about, uh, the sea, sea snake Corliss Valerian and uh-huh. his journeys around the world. You know, he's kind of a Magellan figure in yeah. the Game of Thrones. He, uh, he, you know, so that's pretty cool. And then they also have 10,000 ships, which is, um, it's the story of Nymeria and her uh, leaving Essos and coming to Dorne and bringing the children of the Rhoyne to Dorne and f- found, uh, founding it. That's really interesting to me. They also have Dunk and Egg, which they have a bunch of comics about, which is Sir Duncan the Tall and uh, Egg on Targaryen, his uh-huh. squire. And yeah. it's a series of, of about their lives. Uh, before, you might remember Aegon Divers from, as being the ancient uh, maester on the wall. Right, and this um, is his time as a, as as a, a squire. Yeah, because yeah. he's nearly a century old on the wall. Mm-hmm. So this, this predates all the drama of the books. Yeah, and there's a number of uh, short stories about yeah. Dunk and Egg. Yeah. Dunk and Egg are, are fan favorites. And then there's like a couple of things being developed for uh, animation. So this is a lot of development. And it's yeah. not just cursory ideas. They have like casting going on and they have showrunners and scripting and all that. So that does not mean though um, that it will happen because they... No, they shoved that other one. Yeah, they had one that they shot a pilot for and they were just like, this isn't good and didn't not going to release it, not going to go further with it. Yeah, if I could pick any one of these to survive, um, I might pick uh, 10,000 Ships, the story of the Dornish. That, yeah, I... Um... I'm deep into into the Children of the Ruin too, and so yeah, that one that one speaks to I me. I love everything in Essos. Mm-hmm. Like I just think it's awesome. All right, so that was technically your news. So <laughs> I'm gonna throw in mine. Okay. Uh, Jim Butcher, author mm-hmm. of the Dresden Files, he surprised us. He did this last summer too. Yeah. Um, there is a novella that is coming out July 5th. So just four days after this drops, uh, it's an audible exclusive and it's narrated by Jim himself. He reads oh. it. So this will be book 17.5 in the Dresden files. Cause it's a novella. Um, and I, I dropped a credit immediately. It's only going to be like four hours of content. Normally okay. I don't like to spend a credit on four hours of content, but yeah. I'm on the hook for anything Jim Butcher, uh, I should say Dresden Files. I, I read of, his fantasy stuff too, but yeah. the Dresden Files was really my my favorite. There's a lot of, uh, I feel like, tonal overlap between Constantine and Dresden Files. Oh, 100%. I note yeah. that several times in my, in in my your notes. notes. Yeah. yeah. If you wanted to play a game of Constantine, mm-hmm. you could just get the Dresden Files RPG and reskin the flavor. Mm -hmm. Because he's just a wizard. Mm -hmm. Like, mechanically, you could do everything. It's pretty cool, actually. So that's a... I didn't have much more than that, other than it's cool that I'm getting more Dresden uh, (laughs) content soon. And uh, that's that's pretty nerdy news. So what else you got? I got also nerdy news. uh, Gindy Tartowski... Um, the animator signed an exclusive multi-year cross-studio overall deal with Cartoon Network and Warner Brothers Animation. Oh, wow. Um, and so he's he's exclusive. I mean, he sort of was 
pretty exclusive to them before as it was Mm -hmm. but this made it official and probably i don't know gives him medical benefits or something (laughs) he's Um, a full-on employee yeah and he's um if you're a fan of animation he's uh you know a really good auteur animator his show primal on adult swim Mm -hmm. um a dialogue free show about a caveman and a dinosaur and it's great it's absolutely great um and of course you know he developed uh samurai jack and the original clone wars and dexter's laboratory and just like uh warner brothers knows you know he's one of their meal tickets and they don't want to don't want him going anywhere smart smart anything else from you uh so i got two more neither of them are super important so i'll let you choose (laughs) do you want it uh, uh, gaming scene drama or technology based? Oh, uh, how about we 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 seldom get into drama. Let's do gaming scene drama. Okay, D and D drama. <laughs> Former community manager and D and D influencer, uh, air quotes influencer, uh, Satin Phoenix and her husband Jameson Stone uh-huh. have been uh, accused of. Bullying, cheating writers, artists, and collaborators out of money and credits in various uh, products, such as the ones that they did on Kickstarter. Oof. Um, and it was it started off with a tattoo guy. I think he goes by Nerdy Tattooer on uh, on Twitter, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, not getting um, like not getting treated well by these two, specifically yeah. uh, Jameson Stone, the husband, and. Um, and if you're not sure who these people are, if you're like, who cares about who these people are? Well, um, basically, she used to be a, a Wizards employee, like being a community manager. Um, and she's been in tons of live play shows and um, pretty popular and done multiple Kickstarters for products that she was involved with developing or or, or uh, kind of carrying the flag for. Mm-hmm. And and so they're kind of, kind of popular. They have a strong following. Well, anyway, this tattooer went public with some of the messages that Stone sent him, like mm. about just being just being a dick and kept the receipts um, and uh posted all the screens on screenies on on twitter and then it just that was like that was the 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 flood floodgates opened and everybody else was like yeah check this out posting a bunch of uh a bunch of stuff and it was brutal i will say most of the screenshots of someone being a complete douche mm-hmm. are of uh jameson stone but sateen phoenix uh enabled him and would gaslight people into uh basically thinking that his behavior was okay and normal oof and uh yeah so they suck so um does that mean we should unfollow them on social i already did okay did you do it from the our account too? Oh no, because we, we follow should, them on yeah, Instagram. Okay, yeah, okay, we should we should unfollow. I'll unfollow. unfollow. Them. <laughs> um, you know the thing. The sad thing is, mm-hmm. I actually liked her content when she would do stuff. Like I thought she was pretty good. Yeah, yeah I, good dungeon master. It was, interesting player. It was a follow. I think from your suggestion that we, because I didn't know who it was. But I guess uh, her husband's a dick, and she's a okay with that. A dick enabler. <laughs> Well, and she she did this uh, she did this um, Instagram live feed where she was talking and crying a bunch of crocodile tears. But I think the best comment was it was one of the top ones when she posted her public apology letter was, "You're not sorry. You're sorry you got caught." Yeah, that's the truth of that. And you know, it's like you talk about how the the avalanche starts coming once one person comes forward no one is an asshole to just one person people are generally assholes are generally assholes to many people yeah yeah normally there's always more normally if someone's a bad actor there they do it as a as a matter of standard behavior Mm -hmm. all right well that's all i got for uh for news that is at all matters okay Uh, i'll get one more in here and that was and this is just from today i believe or maybe yesterday um it leaked because uh sucker punch put out a job listing that they are developing a sequel to ghost of tsushima Ooh, that's cool so they they put out a listing for uh they're for someone to let's see delivering interesting and varied encounters in an open world game with a particular focus on me- melee com- or melee combat and stealth and it's like oh 
Sushima. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the cat's out of the bag. Um, you know, it'll probably be several years before that comes out. But Yeah, games are forever in development. Yeah, you know, and we'll... Did you play? You played the first one, didn't you? I, I played it. I did not finish it just because I did not really enjoy the... Um, the combat. I, did, I didn't really enjoy the combat. Yeah. Mm. I, I liked the open world aspect of it. Uh, I thought it was really cool. And I, and I enjoyed some of the more puzzly things about it. And right. Some of the fights were fun, but other fights, it really just felt like... Uh, it was very Twitch combat related and hmm. not all that enjoyable. Interesting. I enjoyed the game. Um, it was. I think it, it made your game of the year or something. It was my game of the year. It didn't like. A, there's games I've liked more than it, but um, I did like the story and I liked the game overall. So I'll definitely play the new one too. All and right. uh, you know, it's always weird. You know, when you have a sequel and you you start over where the last game left off but inexplicably you have to rebuild your skill tree again oh, when you yeah. were the king badass of the game when well, the the first storyline ended yeah i don't like those ones that where you play the same character or whatever i think you should uh they should make it a successor where you play a new person or another mm, like a assassin's new, creed a new style. generation yeah yeah that's assassin's creed has done it right i i don't think that doing the same exact character is a great idea good point well uh why don't we oh we got podcast let's fuel. not skip the podcast fuel yeah this is a pretty good one yeah i'm enjoying it um it is the frost hammer from grains of wrath which are local to here out to where the pod cave is located there in camas washington um this was the 2021 gabf gold medal winner for uh munich style hellas um, floral noble hops, crisp, smooth, and radiantly uh, vivacious. Yeah, this is a really smooth v- beer. It almost has like a, a kind of a crisp, light sweetness to it almost. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. It's really nice. I love uh, these German lagers in the summertime, and today is the summer solstice. And so is this, it? Yeah. Jeez, it doesn't even feel like summer has started. Oh, it's here. It, yeah, today we've, today felt like summer. Yeah, but June has sucked. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah, hey, at least yeah. So this might not be unusual if you don't know. We're in the Pacific Northwest, and you expect it rains here all the time. Um, Normally, it's been an unusually rainy June, I think. Well, and even the spring sucked. We had snow in April. Mm-hmm. That's not normal. But it has got us out of the drought we were in for two years. Yeah, I'm not a farmer. I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all eat farmers' food. Yeah, that, that's true. That's <laughs> we need true. the farmers to survive. Um, so this is a 4.6 ABV. Um, you know, it. Uh, I picked it up. It's got this like a an ice coated warhammer on it and it has a sort of trinity knot you said a trinity knot with a ring in, yeah in the middle of the hammer and uh father hennessy in the movie wears that as a as an amulet and so i thought it tied into the movie pretty well yeah and eventually you know it gets given to you know detective dodson and mm-hmm. she leaves it in the car inexplicable that yeah that's a inexplicable moment we'll have to get to yeah. <laughs> pretty soon why don't we take a break and we'll dive into constantine that's good Okay, welcome back, divers. Let's get into Constantine 2005, directed by Francis Lawrence. Yeah, this is an interesting movie because it's uh, it's not lo- it's not thought of as a, like a huge success. It had mixed receptions, mm-hmm. but it actually made a lot of money. It made over two hundred and thirty million dollars. That's pretty darn good. And that's a uh, global box office, or is that? Yeah, that's worldwide. Okay, yeah, um, Keanu is a bankable star and this is coming off the back of the matrix so that yeah. that makes sense um because i had never seen this movie for basically two reasons critics hated it it had terrible reviews okay. when it came out and fans of the hellblazer comic book hated it the the so prevailing those are, those opinion are two things that recommend it to me because oh, yeah. i generally think that uh, man baby comic book fans are a great litmus test whether something's going to be good or not just going off the opposite of what they say and critics almost always pan movies that are just for entertainment and not artistic value hmm interesting yeah so 
I would say that the in general, um, and my opinions on this have evolved a bit. Um, fans know the the property best. Like you know, like you. I asked you if that since we talked about Dresden Files, I asked sure. you if the TV show was any good, and you, who are a big fan of the books, said no, not really. Yeah, and I so mean, that that wasn't just because it wasn't really that faithful to the books. It was also just because it was kind of hokey. Mm-hmm. Well, that is the sort of thing that people said about this movie. Oh, okay. So, um, so anyways, I skipped it. Um, but then kind of like once it hit streaming sometime, you know, in the, the later part of the teens, mm-hmm. it started developing this cult status and, and the movie started getting reevaluated and people were less stringent with how, you know, like they changed this because like the most glaring thing is that Constantine in the comics is from Liverpool. He's British and he has blonde hair. looks like Sting. So Keanu just didn't look the part. Sure. Or sound like it. And generally the comics set in the UK, well, this is in America and that stuff. But that's really superficial things. Yeah, that's you know? window dressing. Yeah. And so it's not like it was set in Mumbai. Yeah. And he was an Indian dude and right. then they made it an American thing. Yeah. And so as the the sort of the the voice of the internet started changing on this movie, I was like, well, maybe Maybe it is good. Maybe we should check this out. So I was glad to get this opportunity to watch it because I actually did enjoy this movie quite a bit. Yeah. So I saw it in the theater when it came out because I was a am I was and am a Keanu Reeves fan, mm-hmm. and I also thought that it just looked cool when I saw the when I saw the preview. Yeah. And so I just went. I saw it and I really liked it, and I thought it was I thought it was a good movie, and so I'm. I, I haven't seen it since it came out in the theater. So this was, there was a bunch of things I didn't remember oh, that okay. happened. So that's cool because, you know, it's been a long time. But yeah, I thought this was pretty cool. Yeah. So shall we get into our, our beat by beat? Sure. Um, movie opens up. It's got a quote about the Spear of Destiny. He who pes- possesses the Spear of Destiny holds the fate of the world in his hands. And then it cuts to this kind of bleak, almost post-apocalyptic scene uh, where the, and there's three crosses on the top of like a, 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 a concrete structure that's kind of in the Badlands. And it turns mm-hmm. out this is somewhere in Mexico. And there are these, it's, it's like a ruined church. Yeah. And there are people scavenging for goods. And uh, this guy finds like a, he, he, his foot breaks through into some sort of, like secret compartment or something Mm -hmm. yeah and he finds uh wrapped up in old nazi flag he finds the the spear of destiny and he gets instantly smeagled by it he 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 even has the the smeagol body language he's all hunched over and he's holding on to his precious and he he ditches his buddy and gets out of there so i wonder if this whole allusion to mexico and the nazi flag Mm -hmm. um is touching on the historical event where um the uh adolf hitler tried to get uh mexico to invade the united states uh, Mm. during world war ii basically to distract us um they and that hitler said they would he would give uh, Mexico support and help them out and uh, be their ally because at that up until that point Mexico had not declared a side they were neutral in right. the whole deal not that it really mattered because they're far away from the fighting um, but as it turns out the Brits intercepted the intercepted the telegram and it gave it to the Americans and the Americans uh, confronted everyone like hey and Mexico was like, whoa, whoa, we never even responded. Yeah. We can't control what telegrams people tell and send <laughs> us. We weren't going to invade you. Interesting. I didn't really think of that. But so I just, there's a Nazi Mexico connection. Yeah. I just thought of the, you know, fleeing Nazis at towards the end of the war that all kind of jetted for Latin America. Sure. Not there, necessarily Mexico, but Argentina and Brazil and um you know, and that's that's more the connection that I made. That this was a 
uh, plunder that some fleeing Nazi had hidden away there. Yeah, so this, I mean, it could be any of that stuff, Mm -hmm. but for sure, fleeing Nazi stole the spirit of destiny. Yeah, and the guy, as he's he's walking off, he gets promptly hit by a car, um, but the car just wraps around him because he's seemingly indestructible since he has this magic spear. And there's a couple of interesting details. First of all, I think the spear prop looks really cool. Like, Mm -hmm. I really like that piece of, uh, you know, uh, prop uh, design. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, he gets this interest, this emblem on his wrist. It just kind of sears into his wrist and it's a, it's like an, uh, uh, four equal armed cross and a circle. Mm -hmm. Um, and strangely, I have that image tattooed on me, like, I think like four times at this point. Yeah. So, because it, it's just a sun wheel. Okay. Um, it's not because you possess the Spear of Destiny. I mean, I also have a Spear of Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> four of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the the Bible gets the story very wrong. And actually, he got stabbed a few times. Yeah, there were many, uh, <laughs> like, Romans. <laughs> all had spears. <laughs> yeah. No. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. This, that, that was like emblazoned on him. I mean, a four is generous. I have one that's properly like that. It's mm-hmm. on the petroglyph on my foot, Yeah. but the other ones are more like it is a four equal armed with a circle. But anyway, uh, yeah. So then it cuts to what I thought at first was an apartment, but it turns out it's an asylum. Uh, cuts, oh yeah. Yeah. I thought it was an apartment building. Uh, cause we, it's, it's uh oh no you're right you're right it's the yeah. possessed girl yeah 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 because we so it, there's, there's like a... this asian lady and she's making tea and stuff uh yeah she's making tea for her daughter um and she's carrying it back to the bedroom and she's pretty startled when she gets there because her daughter is crawling up the walls yes, um, yes. and clearly demonically possessed who are you gonna call petty dabbler in the dark arts john constantine there you go. Yeah. The, uh, it, it, he, he's kind of the Harry Dresden of this town. You, <laughs> right. you call him uh, wiz- wizard for hire. He'll take care of business for you. Yeah. John Constantine. Um, I still haven't got into those Dresden books, even though you, you sent me the audio files. But um, John, I'm confident John Constantine is much more of a scumbag than Harry Dresden is. Yeah, Harry Dresden's kind of a white knight that fucks up all the time. Yeah, no, Constantine's almost the op where he's a scoundrel that occasionally does good. Ah, okay. Yeah, he's the reverse reverse alignment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he arrives, you know, in the in the yellow cab, and he he drops his cigarette stylishly yeah, out the window. Always smoking in this movie. Yeah. So, throughout the course of the movie, we see him smoke thirteen cigarettes. Uh, hmm. Um. This is something, so Francis Lawrence, this is his feature film debut. I don't know if we've said this before. He's coming out out of the world of music videos. Hmm. Um, And I think what directing music videos, one of the things that that really does for you is uh, the ability to storytell without dialogue, storytell with just images. Yeah. You get so much of uh, Constantine's character just from the way he's filmed and the way Keanu moves and the body language and the way he dresses. Um, This is for the most part, it, it does get into some of the wonky exposition stuff. Mm -hmm. For the most part, this is a very uh, show don't tell movie. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. I I really like, I appreciate that too. Like you, you you go in, you know, like he goes in, Constantine goes in and there's Hennessy is in there. Mm -hmm. Um, who, who's just, he's kind of portrayed as kind of a slovenly fat guy. Who's a priest. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's wearing like dirty clothes. I said a rumpled heavy man. So slovenly fat guy is (laughs) that all (laughs) That means the same thing, but I, I said it nicer. <laughs> I would way rather be called a rumpled heavy man <laughs> guy than a, than a slovenly fat man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Um, Remember that for my epitaph. <laughs> <laughs> he was a rumpled heavy man. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie will not let me put that on your stone. Um, so you get a really good idea of their dynamic because uh, John seems annoyed with him and he's sort of like, I, you I know, found one. As soon as I couldn't pull it out myself, I called you. Um, and so it's weird that he's this priest, um, but clearly he feels like 
John Constantine outclasses him as an exorcist. Yeah. And, and so like he goes in, uh, John goes in there and I love when he like, he opens the window shade and Mm -hmm. the sun shines on the girl who's possessed. And, um, and that of course, like pisses off the demon. Right. And I love the little um keychain thing he pulls out of his pocket and he starts like sorting through mm-hmm. these different uh like glyph things mm-hmm. and then he holds it up to the sun and it shines like the shadow on the demon and it it causes it intense pain. I thought it yeah. was pretty cool. Like basically he has a whole key ring of like holy sigils yeah and he's just looking for the one that pisses this demon off yeah and he finds it and yeah and i mean i thought this was really cool like i remember seeing this the first time and like i i thought the spirit destiny thing was cool and Mm -hmm. then i thought this immediate exorcism was cool this was this is very much like a novel plot like the um the scene in mexico where Mm -hmm. the guy gets um he gets uh totally smeagled by it and then uh and then he the car hits him and the car is destroyed and not him yeah that is your monster prologue right like when you see the white walkers and the prologue for game of thrones game of thrones but then Mm -hmm. you don't see him again forever so you you get a taste of it and then you immediately jump into a scene that shows your main character doing the thing they do the thing that they're known for Mm -hmm. which is the kids and the wolves and all of that in game of thrones and in this it's john doing an exorcism so right off this is following this is following novel writing formulas Mm -hmm. and i really like that because it's good storytelling it is and it's um it's better constructed than usually someone's first movie is sure uh and i think we should probably let's 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 give the screenwriter credit wasn't it there was like a pair of them right uh it was yeah uh kevin uh broadbin and frank capello yeah. And they did a good job so far. I mean, we're barely into the movie, but an exorcism happens and it is pretty darn cool. They do this thing where he um they bring in this big old mirror and have these guys hold it up above the up above the lady. Mm-hmm who's tied to the bed. And I think it's funny because uh, Keanu calls down to the guy in the cab. Yeah, his, his like, buddy Chaz. Yeah, move the car. And Chaz is like, why? And he just like barely pulls it forward a little bit. Yeah. And then they Mis- hold the mirror up. Yeah, and so he, he has it all rigged up on a, like a rope so it, so the mirror can be pulled back. Once. And just jettisoned out the window. Yeah, so that's the, that's the plan. Uh, because the we haven't talked about much the the demon was reluctant to leave the girl, yeah. or rather it wants to leave her, but like out the front door, not not like to be removed. It wants to tear out of her and enter the the mortal plane. Yeah, it doesn't want to go back to hell. It wants to maraud in the world. Yeah, and that's not right. And John is not happy about that. Yeah. So, anyways, they he gets the mirror positioned over her and extracts the demon into the into mirror. Into the mirror. And then is going to jettison the mirror out the window, but it's got kind of an ornate frame, so we have a, a tense moment where they can't get it out, and the yeah. demon's trying to jump out of the mirror, trying to break out of the mirror. Mm-hmm. And one of the guy's hair who's helping him turns white. Oh, yeah, because he, he looks at the mirror. John yeah. told him not to look at it, and he looks at it, and it turns his hair white. Class, this is classic demon stuff. Yeah, and then it jettisons out the window. It smashes on the ground, and that's... Or it smashes on the it cab. It smashes on the back of the ca- cab. Yeah, because yeah. Chaz did not move the Fucking cab far enough. Chaz. Amateur. I'm a fan... Chaz is a no, good. I, I is like a, Chaz. Chaz is a good guy in the comic. I'm not a fan of Shia LaBeouf. Chaz. Why not? I'm just not a fan of him, the actor in general. What's wrong with Shia? Um, I like I really don't know. Actually, yeah, there's there's real life stuff that are wrong with him where he's like a sociopath. Oh, but okay. I also don't like him generally in movies. I very rarely like him. Interesting. Um, and I don't like the the sort of Indian short round vibe they try they try to exactly. go for. Exactly, they try to go with the Doctor Jones uh, thing. Like it doesn't suit John Constantine to have a kid sidekick. Yeah, is this guy from the comics the kid sidekick? Chaz? No, Chaz is the cab driver who always drives John around and is his like his mate. Uh, but he's not like a sidekick or oh, an apprentice. He, he's not an apprentice. Okay. No, he's just like. A homie that helps okay. out. 
yeah. and drives them around in a cab because Constantine doesn't drive. Yeah. So like if you were a exorcist, you could call me and I drive you, you drive around, me around. I'm not an apprentice exorcist. <laughs> so yeah. All right. So I noticed John Constantine grabs a piece of, he, he grabs a, a drawing off the wall as he's leaving. It's yeah, a spirit there's destiny. There's a spirit destiny. And it, it looks pretty cool. Um, and I, we brushed over this, but it's good character stuff. When he gets into the room, he sets down his cigarette on the edge of the counter because he's clearly planning on returning to it after exercising the, the demon. Yeah, like he thinks this is going to be quick and easy. Yeah, but it took longer than he planned, and the cigarettes all burned down. So he, What he, a bummer. Yeah. He loves cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and then it kind of... Um, uh, John John is noting that there's a problem because you know after, on the way out that the standing agreement between heaven and hell is you know this demon was trying to defy it so yeah he seems nonplussed and then it kind of uh, it cuts to a church scene with this lady in a confessional oh he asks before that though we had, he asks Hennessy um, to he asks him to do something he's not really clear on what the thing mm-hmm. is. Um, but he has to take his amulet off, um, and I guess open himself up to the, to the voices he hears. Hmm. Yeah. I must've missed that. Yeah. Must and we also get a, a glimpse of our, one of our villains in there. Cause, uh, the demon Balthazar is Gavin Rosdale. Yeah. Is watching. Oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that either. Mm, there's a few things in there. Um, yeah. So yeah. Cause to a church scene, there's a lady in a confessional and mm-hmm. she's saying she killed a man etc cetera, etc cetera. it turns out she's a cop yeah and um i was i was i thought this was a cut scene this is just a throwaway uh you know it is it's the because she talks about how she always knows where these people are going to be and where to shoot them mm-hmm. and all this stuff it is it's foreshadowing what we find out later that she's psychic yeah and um, it does it does it also lends for confusion because mm-hmm. uh, the next scene, mm-hmm. it seems like the very same lady mm-hmm. is in an institution. And right. it's actually her twin sister, we learn yeah. uh, later on. But she had, uh, she's in an institution and um, she has a brand on her wrist as well. Um, and uh, so this, this institution scene was confusing initially because I forgot that this was her twin sister yeah because it seems like she we go from her scene in the confessional to her waking up in a hospital yes and then like like maybe the confession was a dream or something yeah and then she she goes up the stairs of the hospital uh she tears her hospital wristband off and then um jumps off the top of the building and crashes through the skylight into uh a cross-shaped pool um, and she lands in like the full, you know, crucifixion pose of there. Course. Um, and then, uh, Rachel or not Rachel, um, Angela Dodson wakes up. Um, Angela's very on the nose. The, the theme, the angel devil thing is over and over, repeated over and over. She's Angela. We're in Los Angeles. Um, it's we don't a, have a bad guy na- whose last name is DeVille. We don't have a Cruella <laughs> DeVille. <laughs> Missed opportunity. Damn. They could have had a cruel devil in here. Yeah. But she, um, Angela wakes up suddenly. It's a, it's a double wake up. Mm-hmm. And she wakes up scared. Um, then John Constantine wakes up and he's coughing up blood in the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, it seems clear that he's got respiratory problems. Yeah. And he's... so we go back to the same hospital. Yeah. And he ends up having, he has lung cancer. The, it looks like he's going to die soon. Basically, yeah. the doctor's like, get your affairs in order. Yeah, he has very aggressive lung cancer, and it's already quite advanced. And smoking's gross, divers. Don't do it. Oh, no. Smoking looks cool. If you want to look like a grown-up divers, you should definitely smoke. Candy cigarettes. <laughs> Only candy cigarettes. They don't even sell those anymore. No, because it encourages kids to smoke. I know, but they were cool. You know what's not cool is vaping. It looks like you're sucking on an MP3 player. Smoke real cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, no. I think if you're going to smoke, vaping is better. And it you doesn't can get look the, You can get the littler, little ones. But even, even though <laughs> it, people come up and you smell like cotton candy, nobody wants to smell cotton candy uh, mm. just randomly. 
<laughs> I've never had that complaint. <laughs> you're like, oh, cotton candy, gross. Really? Well, you just walk up and you're like, oh, there's a that's there's a big rough and tumble biker looking dude at a show. Oh, it smells like cotton candy. <laughs> that is funny. That actually is pretty funny. It's kind of like a weird uh, mental uh, thing, whatever. Okay, anyway, smoke so- is cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. And so um, we cut over to Angela. She's at the hospital mm-hmm. and she is going to see her sister because yeah. that dream was more of a, of a vision than, than actually than a dream. Yeah. And, uh, so she goes there and she looks at the body and all that at the, at the morgue. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she refuses to believe that Isabel, who's a devout Catholic would commit suicide because that's a mortal sin. Yeah. It means you can't go to heaven. Yeah, and then as she's leaving, John is also leaving, and he's real shitty to her because she asks him to hold the elevator, and he's like, nah, bye, and yeah. lets the door close. But like, did they know each other before that? Or something? No. He's just randomly He's, he's a dick. just a dick, yeah. Yeah, that's John not, Constantine's that's an asshole. Cool. If somebody wants you to hold the elevator, hold the fucking elevator. So, I think, uh, yes, I agree with that. I'll hold the elevator, even if it annoys people, but... I love this as character stuff because John Constantine is one of these characters. I think that the tendency is to want to make him more heroic than he should be. Sure. And so these moments where he acts just selfishly are good Constantine moments to me that these are, these are true to the character. So we get a quick, another scene with our, um, our, the Mexican guy who's been heading north mm-hmm. uh, with the Spear of Destiny, he jumps over a fence and he's going, walking north and there's like a herd of cattle and they just start, start dropping dead like flies around him. Yeah. It is impossible to see the border fence and not think of the the build that wall oh, yeah. <laughs> stuff. It's like, I, and he just, I just love him just hopping over the border fence. It's like nothing I mean, granted, he has magic powers, but yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, did you see the Jimmy Kimmel? Uh, Jimmy Kimmel did a bunch of uh, a bunch of border fence parody videos or whatever during that presidential election, where he mm-hmm. he would literally pay people, uh, Mexican people, mm-hmm. Mexican Americans, to build a section of fence and and then demonstrate and do it well, and mm-hmm. then show how easily it is defeated. <laughs> And these guys, and he give them more money if they can get over or whatever. And yeah. they just annihilate these fences. It's so easy. Build like they fences do and climb speed. fences. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was hilarious. Um, anyway, yeah. So that scene was pretty cool. I mean, really what stuck with me was the cattle dropping like flies. It was really cool. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know why I bumped up on that because I don't feel like there's a ton of grazing that goes on right on the border. And it's ranch land, man. Right there at the border? I guess it is. You know, it used to be, but it's that's also um, policed N- now. Nowadays, maybe. I think. Yeah. yeah In 2005, I, it was still yeah, and we nice and open. Know when this movie takes place. Because, I mean, yeah. really, it was released in 2005, but the style is really 90s. Yeah, that's true. And I haven't called it out yet, but the whole movie has uh, what the, they call the yellow tint, where. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is often used in it movies. It's kind of grimy. Yeah. To usually it's used to denote like third world countries. Hmm. It's actually there's a lot of pushback against using the yellow tent in in countries because it's not like the sky isn't blue yeah, in yeah. in these other countries it too. It kind of reminds me of Fight Club, the way everything's yeah. dark, the way it's lit. And it ties because the movie's in Los Angeles, um, it ties it all together. Like it ties the region together. And I actually think if it's possible, this is a good use of yellow tint. It's yellow tint, um, for the, for the sake of the aesthetic of the movie, not just to be like racist. Hmm. I didn't know about the yellow tint thing. Um, so basically Constantine then goes and visits this dude who has a whole, bunch of kitschy nonsense is this guy named what beeman is beeman that? yeah beeman has a bunch of like stupid little like toys and things but then he shows that he has dragon's breath he has a mini flamethrower mm-hmm. i thought that was pretty cool um yeah he's got all sorts of he's got uh vials of holy water from the river yeah. jordan uh, and he's got he it's constantine gives him the the kitschy thing because he collects them but he's getting 
Yeah, uh, he's, he's getting, getting real... relics and stuff from Beeman. Yeah, yeah. Beeman is a Beeman is like an underground holy goods dealer, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that's that guy's pretty cool. I like Beeman, and I like um, we didn't talk about it. So Constantine lives in this very cool uh, like loft apartment that is above an old bowling alley. Yeah, and then Beeman's workshop is also in the bowling alley. Like the bowling alley is like a hub of supernatural activity <laughs> in in Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and and so basically, like he he explains to Beeman that he like he just pulled a soldier demon from a girl, mm-hmm. but it wasn't leaving. Yeah, and Beeman's like, no, that's not possible. It's not yeah. possible. He's like, they can. He says they can puppeteer us, but they can't exist on our plane. Yeah. Um, and so John he goes gets in the cab with Chaz, and he goes uh he goes out to to visit. Um, someone at a at a church, and I really like the line in the in the uh, in the cab because uh, Chaz is like, "So how long am I going to be your slave?" <laughs> yeah, you're not a slave, Chaz, but an uh, a noble an appreciated apprentice, apprentice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he's so just like funny. Tonto or Robin. <laughs> yeah, it's like dang, you're not a slave, Chaz. <laughs> Yeah, John Constantine is also a user of people. I think that's a, a big part of his character. Huh. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, b- basically, uh, he he goes and the cop wants, uh, the cop and John both end up showing, uh, where do they show up? It's, it, at a, it's at a big Catholic church, yeah, like a cathedral. And she wants to talk to the father and he wants to talk to uh, somebody else. Yeah, they think that they're in line to see the same person. Yeah, but they're and not. And he's like, first come, first serve. And she's like, just a dick in every situation. <laughs> like, I keep running into you and you're always a dick to me. Yeah. Um, but luckily, they want to see different people. She wants to talk to the father um, because he is not going to give... Uh, a Catholic funeral for her sister because she committed a mortal sin. Um, Yes. Suicide is a mortal sin, but they'll still do a funeral for you. It's just understood. You're going to hell. Yeah. But they still do it for the family. So this is not particularly realistic that the priest wouldn't do the funeral. Um, But it drives home the, the point about suicide. being. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me though. If a, I mean, a real asshole priest was like, well, yeah, I mean, like, like one of those ones that won't give Democrats communion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, I think you're right. There are those those priests who are like, no, it's a mortal sin. I won't do it. Yeah, but there's also chill priests. Sure. Um, Constantine. So, though, Constantine wants to talk to um, Tilda Swinton, mm-hmm. who is Gabriel. This is. Mm. Wonderful casting. Yeah, this I, is a good one. I love it so much. Um, she's so great in this role, and um, I really like this scene. It's actually a scene pretty much uh, straight out of the comics, except for where the conversation happens. A lot of the dialogue comes from Garth Ennis's comics, and the scene is very good. Um, basically, John, we find out, He's trying to bargain for his soul. He's trying to do enough good deeds that he doesn't have to go to hell to overcome his mortal sin. Yeah. Well, she doesn't say specifically your mortal sin for that life you took. Yeah. And so it's sort of implied maybe he's a murderer. Right. Or whatnot. We later learn he also was a suicide. Right. He he talks about it. And so, uh, I mean, does that, is, is uh, murder a mortal sin as well? I mean, I think it's, you know, oddly more, has more loopholes for it than suicide does. Okay. So you can go out and you can just gun down a playground full of kids mm. and you can get forgiven. You can, you but can get absolution not, for yeah, that. You, yeah. But you cannot, if you kill yourself for taking your own life, you yeah. have a, 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 a fatal condition or something to mm-hmm. alleviate your suffering. Okay. Got oh, it. Got it's, it. It's real rough. These just are... standard religious nut job logic. But I like, though, that in this world of angels and demons and stuff that, that Constantine trucks in, um, though that nut job logic is all very concrete. These are the rules of the mm-hmm. world. Um, that's really important. We talk about storytelling, like that the internal logic of the world makes sense to itself. It's consistent to itself. Oh, yeah. That's a Sanderson has a, um, a whole 
essay on that about mm-hmm. the Sanderson's laws of magic. And one of them are, um, that there must be internal consistency within the system so that, um, the reader can rely on it and the logic is coherent and, uh, makes people buy into it more that way when, if there ever is an exception, yeah. then it has to be like, you know, chosen one status or something like that. Exactly. And so she tells John, um, you're fucked. And yeah. so he, he leaves and Angela's leaving at the same time and it's pouring down rain and he goes, at least it's nice out. And I don't know, that's one of my favorite lines in the whole movie is when he comes outside and says, at least it's nice out. Yeah. I thought he was being cheeky. Mm-hmm. Just, And then he just takes off into the rain and Chaz calls after him. And this is the first time Angela hears his name. He hears him call him John Constantine. Yeah. And so she makes a little mental note of that, I think. Yeah. So then we cut to a a scene with Hennessy, who Mm -hmm. at this point, I hadn't heard his name yet. So I just labeled him Chonky Priest. (laughs) Uh, He's engaging in psychometry. Yeah. He's reading the newspapers psychically and finding resonance with different stories and things. Yeah, and we're getting a better idea of like what his affliction is because he talked about he he drinks to quiet the voices basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he's is that why we have beer every time we podcast? Oh yeah, so it's <laughs> it's quieter here in the room. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so he drinks to drown out the voices without drinking and without his amulet. He's just constantly bombarded with this sort of psychic noise. He's getting just tons of overheard conversation and everything, but it leads him to a newspaper article about Isabel Dodson. Yep. Her suicide. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we cut to, uh, we cut to the, uh, detective. Yeah. She's watching security footage and she hears Isabel uh, like turn over her shoulder and say, Constantine before she jumps. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So cut over to John. He's coming out of a gas station, presumably buying more cigarettes. And he gets attacked by a a demon made out of swarming insects. I like that when he he walks out uh, and he looks up at the billboard and it says, your time is running out. Uh Uh-huh. And then buy a Chevy. (laughs) (laughs) I like that too. Yeah. Um, Yeah. He gets a, he sees a night bird fly by. mm -hmm. Um, well, it was like a crow, right? Yeah, but which it, are not nocturnal. But yeah, but it was at night, so it tells me this is a supernatural bird of some kind, right? And, and then, then there's a rat. He sees a rat, and then there's a crab. The crab is inexplicable. Yeah, the <laughs> other ones could exist in a city, and then he's attacked by a swarm of roaches. Yeah, and so um, I think this is a. There's a demon called, I think, Minmon in one of the early issues of Hellblazer Mm -hmm. that attacks people like this, makes bugs attack them. And uh, I think this is a reference to that. And it's actually a pretty cool effect. I think the effects hold up pretty well in this movie. Yeah, overall. And eventually, yeah. uh, He lures it out in the street and it gets squished by a car. Yeah. And then he meets up with uh, Chaz again. Mm Mm-hmm. And he wants to go, Chaz wants to get into Papa Midnight's bar. Mm -hmm. And, but when you go down the stairs and the big muscle bound bouncer guy, he holds up a card and you have to identify what's on the card without seeing it. Yeah. It's like uh, Peter Vinkman's experiment at the beginning of Ghostbusters where he has people guess the, what's he's, what's on the card he's holding up. Uh, John does it immediately as, and he gets entrance in, uh, Chaz can't do it. No, nope, not a psychic. So he's he's blocked out of midnight's of midnight's bar. And there's perfect circle music playing. That's pretty <laughs> cool. There's really good lighting. You can tell this is like a, a hip uh, supernatural hangout. Looks like there's a bunch of demons and stuff down there. Yeah, it's it's pretty. I think it's visually pretty cool. I yeah. uh, I didn't enjoy the perfect circle music. I was you like, don't like I was like, oh, this is sounds like Tool, but worse. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I like perfect circle. Yeah, I know you do. That's and that's fine. I don't. I don't like to shit on them, but um, I do like Papa Midnight's Bar. And you notice uh, this is the place where angels and demons fraternize with each other. Yeah, because you see the the red eyes of the demons, and I think the are they yellow, kind of yellowish. Yeah. yeah, and of the of the angels, and um, so this is a this is a place where uh, 
the supernatural forces they have uh it's like neutral ground and they can they can let loose and party with each other yeah and uh so he goes into the back room uh and uh basically john tells him what's up and he says no that can't be happening no way demons are trying to stick around yeah and john he asks to use the chair and uh you know he Papa Midnight won't do it because he takes no, he takes no, he doesn't help one side yeah, or the he's, other. He's Switzerland. Yeah. Um, so I should say Papa Midnight is a character from the comics. Uh, this is a more goodly natured Papa Midnight than the, than the kind of racial caricature that he was in the comic books. I think uh, Jimon Hansu is a, is a, a nicer Papa Midnight than the one we're used to. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was a really cool character. Um, and then Gavin Rosdale walks into the room, and it's Balthazar, mm-hmm. the half-demon. And uh, he's there to see Midnight. And John, of course, didn't have an appointment. This was Balthazar's appointment time. Yeah, and so John has to go. And he starts having a coughing fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he leaves. Um, I found Gavin Rosdale really distracting, like, because it's... Uh, I don't think he's a very strong actor. He's all right. He did fine in this this role. Mm, I don't think so. But <laughs> um, they should have had Shia LaBeouf do this role and have Gavin Rosdale be Chaz. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be interesting. That'd be an interesting flip around. I thought Gavin. Well, in, anyways, let's let's keep going. This is not to get hung up on the Gavin Rosdale of it all. Um, John has to leave. And he's he goes back to his apartment. He's having a, a pity party for himself, and he he hotboxes a spider with a cigarette smoke under a cup. Yeah, and Angela shows up at his place, mm-hmm. and she uses her badge to get him to let her in, <laughs> which is kind of a low life move because she's not on duty. Yeah, um, so she's she's lame. It's fine. He's a low life. So yeah, he I mean that. they're both shitty people. Let's just say <laughs> that. Um, so far, the only person in this movie, there's two people that I think aren't shitty, and that's Beeman and Chaz. Mm, Hennessy, he's uh, seems like a. He's dirty and an alcoholic. <laughs> I don't know. He does. He drinks to drown the voices out. He's. I think it's does understandable. Does he not wash his clothes to drown the voices <laughs> out? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just because uh, his priestly raiment is very hot to to wear in that Los Angeles heat, and just makes him real sweaty because he's a big guy. <laughs> All right. Anyways, Angela explains the story about her sister, uh, and John's unmoved. Right? Yeah, he's just a complete dick the whole time. Yeah, he's, he's just like stonewalls her. Yeah, he's like, sounds like you have a theory, detective. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Yeah, and and she's basically like, help me. And he's like, nope. (laughs) And so, um, you know, he says some mean words to her, and she gets mad and leaves, understandably. Um, But right after she leaves, uh, what do do demons fly in? A flock? A Uh, flock of demons? A flock of demons? A flight of demons? A flight of demons, yeah. A flight of demons flies by the window, and he's like, well, that's unusual. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so he, he follows her outside, and then he drops some exposition on her, uh, explaining the standing bet between God and the devil yeah. over the souls of all mankind. And she doesn't buy it. Yeah, she's a she's a real skeptic of everything. Um, but as they walk, the streetlights are clicking off behind them, um, and they end up standing in front of like a, a Mexican church, and the only thing that's lit up is the the Virgin Mary in the window, um, and John gets some out of his magic. Uh, doodads out yeah and uh lights them up and the sky is filled with demons over them and yeah he basically uses like a flash bang of true faith and like mm-hmm. they all get vaporized yeah and so she comes around to his way of thinking after that i should mention at this point now it's clear that this cop lady is teaming up with john mm-hmm. uh, in the first dress and file novels uh uh harry dressing gets called in to uh he's he's a contractor he gets called in to do advising on a police case Mm -hmm. and he ends up having a contentious relationship with a female cop on the squad who eventually becomes his friend and they become like partners like sidekick so this is very reminiscent so what year is the first dresden files book i have no idea okay I think the Hellblazer comics started 
in 87. Yeah, this is probably before that. Okay. Although none of that is holy rolling stuff. It's straight up wizardry. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, so basically, yeah. Uh, so they go back to Angela's apartment. Cats are half in and half out. We learn. Yeah. Cause so John, he needs to spend some time with stuff that belonged to Isabel. Um, and she fills up a pot of water for him and he sits down in a chair, puts his feet in the water. In his shoes. In his shoes. Like that always savage. <laughs> Every time that bothers me. Oh, well, actually, you know, when he does the chair later, he takes his shoes off. Yeah. Finally. Um, Benny holds her smoky cat in his lap and stares into its eyes because cats have that unique relationship with, with the supernatural world. Yeah. And uh, we get a little vision of hell. It's like this apocalyptic reflection of the real world. I think hell looks really cool in this movie. I do too. And I especially like when mostly the streets of hell are deserted, but you see the subterranean and it has this sort of damned souls in torment, uh, you know, like tableau or whatever looks like a Hieronymus Bosch painting um and I thought stylistically that was really cool and when I was uh looking at old reviews of this the the one from Roger Ebert's website said that the hell looked like it was made by like a an animator while he was sleeping or something like that and I was like that just seems totally out of line I think hell looks actually is actually one of the the really cool elements of yeah, this movie. Yeah, I thought so too. And I, I, yeah, I just thought it was really cool. So we learn, we basically learn that uh, Angela uh, did indeed commit suicide, or not Angela, Isabel. Uh, Isabel did indeed commit suicide. Yeah. He he sees it. Her, and- so, her soul is there in hell, and he goes to her, and she gets him her hospital wristband right before he's swarmed by those soldier demons. Yeah. And um, then when he comes back to the real world, he mm-hmm. explains to Angela that he committed suicide as a teenager because he had the ability to see supernatural and it drove him crazy. He thought mm-hmm. he was crazy, but he died. He was only dead for like two minutes, mm-hmm. but that was enough. That's long enough. That that's he- some bullshit. If you didn't act, if, if they brought you back, that's not a suicide. That was an attempt. In Attempted suicide. Yeah. It is the attempt of mortal sin. Apparently. Apparently, I mean, in it is. this world, in their in their hardcore rules of this will get you damned. Um, mm-hmm. That's a damning. That's a damning offense. I love the the little kid that they have playing Keanu. It looks so much like a baby Keanu Reeves. Yeah, they did a good job. Very casting good casting. That kid. Um, and s- they move forward, and you go to the morgue. Yeah, Father Hennessy is visiting Isabel's body at the morgue. He finds the symbol on her wrist. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he just immediately, um, like he tries to pull out his flask and drink from it Yeah, and nothing will come out. Yeah. Cause like as soon as he touches her, he starts having like a, an episode, his eyes yeah. go white. Um, he thinks that her body moves and the security guard comes in there and he flees, flees out of there. Cause the, the voices are just kind of getting louder and louder and he runs across the street to the liquor store and he starts trying to drown or to down booze. Like he's he's tries to drink a bottle of yeah, wine. Nothing will go. Nothing in his comes mouth. out. He's smashing vodka bottles and trying to pour it in his mouth. Nothing's coming out. And then he grabs a bottle opener and he stabs his hand a whole bunch of times. Yeah, he carves as he's dying. He carves something into his hand. Uh, and then uh, we cut to John and Angela, who are uh, they're at a diner having breakfast for dinner, and you know talking about john's childhood and everything uh when angela gets the phone call um you know there's been a what a suicide i guess in in the liquor store and they go to investigate yeah and uh the other cops are like what's he doing here yeah she's like oh he's okay he's yeah because everyone kind of knows about constantine but no one really approves he's a flim flammer (laughs) he's yeah he's a a confidence man (laughs) and uh so father hennessy apparently drowned himself in alcohol in under a minute because alcohol was coming out of all of these things yeah balthazar made him have a weird hallucination or whatever yeah, you know, that Balthazar is a real dick. Yeah, he didn't kill 
uh, Hennessy. Hennessy killed himself. Yeah, and we see that the the guy that runs the liquor store is an angel too. Yes. It's a it's a weird weird job for an angel, but yeah, you know, yeah, you get you take work where you can, I guess. Um, and I, we, there's no moral judgment on alcohol. We enjoy alcohol. Sure, I, and I think uh, and so John sees the symbol carved into Hennessy's hand. Yeah, he puts a, like a, a hanky on his hand and gets a, a blood print of the of the symbol. Yeah. And uh, it's the same as the brand that, that Isabel had and the same as the, the Mexican scavenger with the spear had. Um, and so John calls B-Man and tells him... I, it's and the B-Man. American podcaster with the <laughs> image on his foot. Yeah. He calls it and tells him, um, you know, tells him Angela... Or John calls B-Man and tells Angela that he needs to see where her sister died. That's what... That's what my note says. And so they go back to the hospital. Um, and John kind of basically bullies Angela until she can find a clue. Yeah, he's like telling her that hell has a Bible. And they're looking around. And um, yeah, she eventually finds it. Yeah, she, um, her and her sister used to leave messages to each other, like in their breath on windows and stuff like that. So there's a... Isabel left uh, a scripture passage, um, but it's a passage that does not appear in the earthly Bible. Yes. And so that's when the, the demonic Bible comes out. Yeah, not to be confused with the satanic Bible. Yeah, that's a totally different book. That's from another flim flam man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so they call B-Man, and B-Man has, of course, a copy of the, the demonic Bible, and he reads the passage. And it's this prophecy about um, Mammon, the son of the devil, and what it takes for Mammon to cross over mm-hmm. into onto the earthly plane. Um, and then, while well, you know, he, he finishes the... the pertinent reading but then he gets attacked by that that bug demon and then he he lives up to his his name b man and is literally swarmed by insects from the inside out so i wanted to touch on something like Mm -hmm. when they're in the room and he john's trying to get her to figure out whatever right first of all he lays hands on her and like pushes her up against the wall whatever it's a movie that happens uh so I'm willing to say, you know, whatever, that's not cool. But John's not cool. We understand that. Right. But the other thing that just defies belief is no cop would let you do that. <laughs> they will fuck you up or shoot you if you, like, slam them against a wall or whatever. There's no way that happens. Yeah. That's one that's... thing that happens in the Dresden File books is, like, the cop, Karen, uh-huh. she fucks uh, Harry up. Like, yeah. If if there's a physical confrontation, Harry loses. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, we're we're supposed to think because she's so she's so traumatized and so in her trauma at the moment that she's not uh, she's not even herself. She's not even herself. Yeah, she's in her like uh, she's in a child a childish state in her mind in this moment, which makes it even less cool to manhandle her. Oh yeah, it's. It's really like this is really a bat. It it works. Yeah. Um. But this is a trope in noir stories. The our hard boiled detective in the noir story is generally a dick to women. That okay. kind of happens a lot. Not that that makes it okay, but it is very in keeping with the style of story that this is. Yeah. So I mean, ultimately, what we get out of this whole thing is. Beeman is able to tell him that Mammon is going to conquer the world by possessing a powerful psychic. Mm-hmm. And we now know who's a powerful psychic. Oh, she hasn't revealed it yet, right? That she's psychic? I think, uh, did she not? I thought she basically <laughs> said that her and... Oh, you're right. I think when they were, uh, maybe when they are having breakfast. Something like that. Yeah. And um, then we cut to the guy with the spear again, and he steals a really cool old Toyota Land Cruiser. Those are awesome. At this point, I'd completely forgotten about that guy. And so when he shows up again, I'm like, oh, that guy. He's still he's, headed north. He's still headed north. It takes a long time to walk to Los Angeles from, from Mexico. Yeah, I mean, but then once he steals a car, he's on, yeah. he's on Now, now he's cruising. Yeah. So John has to have a, a post, all of my friends are dying cigarette. Uh, and this is where Angela confides that she's, she's a psychic and she always uh, hid her gift from her parents because her sister would talk about it. And that's why her sister ended up getting institutionalized. Yeah. And, and she kind of sorts it out that 
her sister killed herself to stop Mammon from using her. Right. So it's basically like, oh, well, I guess you sacrificed yourself for the good of everyone. Yeah. And so she wants John to do for her basically what what he did when he traveled to hell. She feels that she needs to do this. Um, and he warns against it, but, you know, she insists. And so he, he relents and he says, if, you know, there's no turning back after this. You see them and they see you understand. Cause this will put her on the demon um, radar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they go and dunk her in the bathtub because water's water's a universal conduit. And because we're we're jumping into the deep end, we're going to do total submersion. Yeah, not just your feet. Yeah. She leaves her shoes on, too, which I also thought was weird. Yeah, and so she, like, goes into the water, and she's holding her breath. And mm-hmm. then she's like, okay, my breath's out. Time to surface. And John's like, nope. Yeah, he holds he underwater. And drowns her. And it's a pretty tough scene. And um, obviously, this was a, a tough day for... Um, God, what's what's the actress? Rachel Weiss that plays Angela. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's like all day in the bathtub. Like this is a long day of shooting. Yeah. It was a pretty grueling day. Um but you know, eventually uh the bathtub like explodes and she comes out and she knows that someone has been there. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now the, she uh she yeah, she's steaming too, so yeah. you could tell she was in hell. You know what bothered me about this scene, besides, uh, you know, violence against women, which is kind of is disturbing. Um, tubs are not just made out of porcelain. There's a cast iron. Yeah, there's metal in there. Yeah. yeah. So it couldn't just explode like that. Like, it just wouldn't work that way. And I was like, that's not a real bathtub. <laughs> Bathtubs aren't really made out of just porcelain. That's a prop bathtub. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought that was interesting. Did you know that the actress is married to Daniel Craig? No. Uh, James Bond? I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. It's, yeah. Uh, and, so um, they go back down to Beeman's workshop, and she, uh, she had a vision of the coin, Balthazar's coin, that mm-hmm. he, that he uh, goblin kings around on his fingers. Mm-hmm. And when they go down there and into Balthazar's or into Beeman's place, she finds it Mm -hmm. and uh, she starts rolling it on her knuckles. And um, of course, John's like, wait, what's that? Yeah. And then they see Beeman has this super cool setup with all this rad occult gear. Yeah. And John builds the holy shotgun. Yeah, the Which crucifix, is, golden crucifix street sweeper shotgun. Mm-hmm. With I a, mean, a, a, and, a, and not not just a shotgun because it also blasts dragon breath too. It's pretty cool. I it mean, is. it's lame, but it's cool. Like <laughs> all at once, it's it's over the top. And so, uh, Keanu had uh, one made out of brass, made commissioned like like a because obviously the one they use in the movie is light Mm -hmm. he had a real metal one made and gifted it to the director for oh that's cool yeah so there's two of those holy shotguns at least two there's probably more than two one is legit one's legit and and the director has it as a as a gift from keanu um he uses matrix millions for that (laughs) (laughs) he you know he just does good things he's a he's a real he's a nice a nice chap He's not, he's not like mm-hmm. John Constantine. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he gears up, he gets ready to go on a murder spree mm-hmm. and then, um, he leans in like he's going to kiss her or something. It's, mm-hmm. it's all creeper. And he hands her the holy symbol and says, you're going to stay in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, do you really think that's going to happen? He, no, she's, I obviously, mean, come she, on. obviously she's not going to stay in the car and she tells him as much. Um, but He's not wrong. He's not wrong to give her the amulet. I think he absolutely should have. And he's not wrong to tr- encourage her to stay because if she goes, she's what the demons want. So yeah. bringing her into the demons' lair is a, is a bad move. But he's a big boy, and he should know she's going to come. Yeah, she should be getting on a plane mm-hmm. and heading somewhere like like the Vatican. <laughs> hey, that's that's good thinking. That's <laughs> that's good planning if you're trying to not be possessed going where there are many holy relics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um obviously she's going to leave the car. What is weird is that when she takes her jacket off, uh the amulet goes with it cuz yeah. it was around her neck. So I don't understand 
like unless he just hung- ta- I've never taken off a jacket and had my necklace go with it. Mm-hmm. Unless it was like he <laughs> hung it on her ear or something ridiculous. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah. Anyways, she takes her jacket off because she means business. But for some reason, the amulet goes with it. Uh, John goes and he blasts Balthazar with the, the holy shotgun. Um, doesn't do much because uh, he's immune to fire because he's a demon. But he hits him with one of those uh, holy water hand grenades. And it like busts open his face. And I love it that he has a holy knuckle duster. Yeah. Is that where you got the idea for that? Cause, no, no. Because that I was didn't. a relic in a, in a role playing game we played. No, I, I didn't at all. Um, I just thought it was, it was a fun coincidence mm-hmm. that it came up the holy knuckle duster. Yeah. And so that, that combination of a sanctified knuckle duster and, uh, you know, Christmas ornaments loaded with holy water from the river Jordan. Um, it gives him the the upper hand to just work this demon. Yeah. And he basically, he pounds the shit out of Balthazar and, um, he's going to kill him, but he, uh, he starts administering his, his last rites to him Yeah, in, you know, so that once he dies, he'll end up going to heaven. And that's how he extorts Balthazar into explaining what's going on. And then, of course, at the end, he goes, it only works if you're willing. <laughs> yeah, because you can't you can't uh, forcibly redeem someone. Yeah. They, they have to want redemption. Yeah. Um, but Balthazar is a dipshit. He's kind of a dummy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then and then you see, uh, you know, like so Balthazar doesn't die, but then some unseen entity mm-hmm. just comes in and like kills him and yeah. grabs Angela. Yeah. Balthazar, because John shoots him, right? Yeah. So he's blasted to pieces, but he's still alive. Yeah, like his face is still talking. He right. probably lived through that. Yeah, and then his his co-conspirator shows up, and he's expecting a rescue, and it doesn't go his way. Um, and like you said, Angela just gets like sucked through multiple walls, right? Yeah. Like she's pulled through many walls, and John chases after her, and um, we just get this sort of like... Uh, like a drone shot or helicopter shot from the outside of the building and the sound of flapping wings. Yeah. Um, did you for a second not think this was Gabriel? Uh, I thought it was either Gabriel or Mammon. I didn't mm-hmm. know. I was just like, ah. Uh, yeah, I feel like um, it was, to me, it was, it felt very obvious that it was her at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, John goes after this and marches into Midnight's Bar blasts his his door to his office with the holy shotgun and demands to to use the chair and then uh they look at this chair and it's an electric chair that's Mm -hmm. you know killed over 200 people or whatever and i just was thinking like huh i wonder if those are like collectible or if they're destroyed by the state like or if there are any that exist like that usually i think so yeah i think that is something because um State property like that, when you stop, when they stop using they auction it, it, it gets auctioned off. Yeah, man, I wonder how much that. So, I not that I want it because I'd be <laughs> creeper, but I'm just curious, like a collector, how much would they pay for something like that? Because it looks really cool. It does look cool. Um, it's definitely not something Lisa would allow in the house. <laughs> <laughs> like, I could see having something like that as a conversation piece, but no, it would not. It would not fly in my house. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So because of all the like the death energy of the of the chair, um, John's going to use it to ether surf and locate the spear and and kind of where the enemies are at. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's it's basically like he went to hell earlier. They have to get his feet in water and then they zap him like uh, Papa Midnight busts open like an Edison bulb and uh zaps the the water that his his bare feet are sitting in and he gets these visions he sees the sees the spear is at the hospital a lot of stuff centers around this hospital mm-hmm. uh he sees the the sort of demon horde that is there protecting it um and then the guy with the spear grabs john like psychically grabs him and, and midnight has to pull him out yeah, and it, I, I keep wondering, like, why does Papa Midnight have this chair? Like, why does he have it if he's not part of the uh, conflict or whatever? Yeah, just it's for just, info gathering? Well, or? and he has, like, a whole, like, 
room full of relics. Like he has yeah. all sorts of stuff. And he, you know, you get little bits of his backstory about him being a powerful witch doctor. Uh, yeah. And you get the impression that him and John had adventures together and, and stuff like that. So he hasn't always been just a, a bartender of a neut- neutral ground bar or bar owner, proprietor. Yeah. Um, in the past, he did more like he, he was magic. active. Yeah. Um, and Chaz comes in and Chaz is, uh, he's a little uh, starstruck to finally meet Papa Midnight. Yeah. And then they're, they're making consecrated shotgun slugs. They're melting down relics and making slugs. And Chaz is really good at reloading. He is. And, and he's good at planning because he basically comes up with the scheme. He and knows all the lore. And they're both pretty impressed with him, especially Papa Midnight is very mm-hmm. taken with Chaz. Um, and so he basically, he tells Constantine, you should take this kid with him or with you. And when they're leaving, he says, come see me for a membership uh, if you live. Yeah. And he, he blesses him and uh, he goes to give Constantine the blessing and Constantine just like shrugs. He's like, Walks come off. on. Yeah. There's another, I like. I, I would have taken that blessing. You, it, it, anything can help. Yeah. <laughs> I think at that point, you're, you're happy to get it. Take what you can. And so then, uh, yeah, you, you uh, cut to Angela. She's uh, mm-hmm. she's in a pool. Yeah, she gets dropped through the, the skylight, which I guess luckily they haven't closed it up yet. Mm-hmm. Dropped into that pool, um, the same one that her, her sister died in. And, uh, you know, the spear guy rises up out of the pool behind her, and Angela starts shooting him, but it, he's bleeding, but he's not slowing down yeah he's possessed it's mm-hmm. all good and there's a bunch of people in the adjacent room yeah like basically like the waiting room of the hospital is like filled with demons. Half demons yeah and so the plan is when they get there they have Chaz has this holy relic he's going to drop it into the hospital's reservoir john's going to go and face the demons he'll set off the sprinklers they'll all get doused with holy water and then uh they'll be weakened and he can go through essentially and and blast all of them. And that's exactly what happens. That is exactly what happens, but I don't want to underplay it. It's a really good action scene. Yeah, I do like it. Keanu does good action scenes. He does. And he does, he does all his own stunts in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, as do Shia LaBeouf and Rachel Weiss and Keanu more or less choreographed this scene. Um, you know, this is a first time director. Keanu's coming hot off of doing three Matrix movies in a row. Yeah. He knows what he's doing and he basically show ran this whole sequence. And it's good. Like, I think this is like, it's almost like it makes it a predecessor to, to John Wick and stuff like that. Yeah. This is really good. I mean, and the John Wick movies are mm-hmm. amazing. Um, Cause yes. I, so I, I, I thought that that Holy Street Sweeper was really rad. Yeah. I had this sense when the scene started that this is going to get really corny Mm -hmm. and it actually didn't like, I was like, that was actually pretty cool. I'm, I'm digging this. I'm very impressed with this. Yeah. So then he eventually does get into that other room Mm -hmm. and he finds that Angela has been possessed by mammon. Yeah. Cause we've been cutting over to her and she's been in hell uh, you know, cause she's submerged in the water again. So she crosses over and she's got the, she's got the demon in her and they wrestle her down and they try to, they attempt to exorcism and it seems like it works. And but Chaz seems to be doing a really good job. Yeah. He's useful. Chaz is very competent and, uh, the demon tries to crawl out of her the same way the demon in the, in the girl did. Like it's pressing through her skin kind of. Uh, alien style yeah and um you know chaz really steps up and they're they're doing the exorcism rites and you know they think they have it all all handled because she she kind of comes back to normal and chaz takes the moment to gloat and is a little premature because he gets psychically blasted into the floor and ceiling and uh, yeah, floor again beat up again telekinetic pummeling and he mm-hmm. dies <clears throat> and i was just thinking why why did they have this bit character that only actually had a decent redeeming moment near the end and then he died? Because it's a, even though, so Chaz is a long running character in the comics, 
But as a general rule, anyone that works with John Constantine ends up dying horribly. Okay. He's he's a bad person to be friends with. Um so it's very Is Hellblazer still running? Uh yeah, we're running again. It's uh it was a real Re- rebooted or something. Mm-hmm. It rebooted um but it was a long running series for, you know, up until the middle 2000s and then there was a break and then it came back and yeah, Hellblazer's still around. Cool. Um and I've been reading a bunch of them and surprising no one all those old Vertigo comics from the late '80s are really good. Yeah, Hellblazer, I mean, Sandman, Swamp Thing, Animal Man, Doom Patrol. Read all of them; huh. they're all great. You know, if you, if I had them on like in trade paperback, I'd, I'd do it, or or some sort of subscription service. I bet you have probably Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited? No, I don't. You don't? Does Carrie? Uh no, she does. She does like uh, manga and manhwa stuff. Okay. Well, there's manga on Comixology, too. So okay. Kindle Unlimited has all that stuff? So Kim, Kindle Unlimited and Comixology Unlimited are redundant to each other. Mm. You have one, you have both. Interesting. Yeah. I bet she has a Comixology, maybe. Yeah. Lisa had a Kindle Unlimited, and through it, I uh, got the first volume of Hellblazer because it's free for uh, Unlimited members. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So anyway... That's our... We always pitch something for Amazon. They should pay us. Yeah. Well, they own everything. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So basically, Constantine then uh, uh, he tries know. to use his magic tattoos. Right. He, he has to hold his arms together to make the the image form one tattoo. Yeah. And surprising no one, Gabriel the angel shows up for her heel turn. Oh yeah. And explains her cockamamie scheme. Where she's trying to facilitate uh, the Antichrist coming um, because it's going to... Because men really find their their most noble potential when faced with adversity. So letting demons take over the world will inspire uh, men to be worthy of God's love. Yeah, they'll be their most noble selves when they're facing true horror. Yeah, this is a terrible logic stream for for gabriel you know immortal beings have so much time and the longer you think about things the dumber the schemes you get it's like the more crazy things start seeming logical and you know after you've had you've been around for several millennia or whatever Mm -hmm. sure this seems like a good idea i guess sure and so gabriel basically tosses constantine aside just Mm -hmm. fucks him up and she's gonna pierce angela with the spirit of destiny to Mm -hmm. unleash mammon yeah and constantine's trying to figure out a plan and so he slits his own wrist to kill himself so that lucifer will come and collect his soul personally yes and lucifer shows up and it's carl hungus from the big lebowski yeah (laughs) he shows up and i was like i just said i was like we want the money lebowski (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. And he looks, he is a very sleazy Lucifer. He is. I like it. I i like a beautiful Lucifer, but I also like a, a sleazy, sleazy Lucifer like this. Yeah. Um, and Constantine, you know, we, we'd heard earlier that he's the one soul that Satan would come himself to collect. Mm-hmm. And so Constantine, uh, you know, pulled it that card. It egotistical, but it was true. Yeah, it was true. He showed up for it. And he tells Lucifer what's going on. And Lucifer kind of brushes everything off right up until the, the Spear of Destiny part. And he's like, that gets his attention. He's like, oh, a legit artifact. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, well, if you don't believe me, go go check. And he goes and checks. And uh, he, he sees it's true. He sees uh, Gabriel has the spear. And he mm-hmm. he takes Angela out of the way at the last second and uh, sends his son back to hell and uh, and puts the whammy on Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel tries to smite Lucifer, but mm-hmm. it, we learn that God has abandoned uh, Gabriel and Lucifer uh, burns away her wings and uh, she's kind of left there as a wreck. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so Lucifer goes. He walks back over to John. He's gonna he's gonna collect his soul, but he does owe him a favor now. And so John asks 
uh, for him to free Isabel from hell. Yeah, because he offers to extend John's life, but John's like, nah, free Isabel from hell. And that's like a that's like a double whammy because that act of uh, selflessness earns John uh, redemption. Mm-hmm. And so Lucifer re- uh, released her and John starts ascending to heaven. Yeah. And uh, he's he's ascending to heaven and he gives Lucifer the finger as he's going. And that's another one of my fa- favorite Constantine moments in the movie. It's a good, good display of Constantine-like yeah. behavior. And then Lucifer's like, ah, fuck that. And so he like <laughs> cures his cancer and revives him. He's like, I'm not letting you die. Yeah, because the devil can play a long game. And basically the bet, the bet is if I let you live you'll get yourself damned again here pretty soon. And yeah. then I'll get to collect your soul. You know, this this good deed's not going to last. You're going to undo this at some point. Yeah. And then uh, Lucifer leaves and, um, and Gabriel's there and she's like trying to talk to him and uh, uh, Constantine punches her. Yeah. She tries to goad him into killing her. Yeah. And yeah. He, he doesn't take the bait. But it he, was not very good goading. Like, you couldn't <laughs> have goaded me into that. And I... Yeah. And um, I do... I love this moment, though, because Gabriel's, like, basically uh, feeling really good. She's like, look how good you're doing, John. <laughs> you could have killed me. <laughs> and he's just like... Basically, she feels like she's inspired him to be a better person. Yeah, yeah. She's, and so she's like, this is a win. I I did good angel work today. Yeah. <laughs> Got b- wings burned off. Yeah. Abandoned by God. And then and no the movie, uh, the end credits music start playing. And the movie sins seems like it's going to end right here. But no, we get a shitty postscript green screen shot of John and Isabel talking on a rooftop. Mm-hmm. Um, where he gives her the spear of destiny and uh, tells her to hide it, and they have a sort of semi romantic moment. Yeah. And I feel like it totally undercuts the good ending of the movie. Yeah, I think they should, they did not need that last little section. Yeah, it's clear, like, it's clearly green screen. It tonally doesn't fit with what was just going on. And uh, it just reeks of after sh- like reshoots after the movie was already screened. Huh. Like this, this feels like they finished the movie and screened it, and the studio is like, people are like, that's not a happy ending. Yeah, we need a happier ending. And it just like it can really we get. Can we get? Uh, can we get John and Angela mm-hmm. having a nice romance at the end? Can we just say they're happy? I hate it. I hate. It. I hate when they do this, and I hate this part of the movie. And then even worse than that is after the credits, there's Mm -hmm. a stinger where now Chaz is an angel. And he's wearing the goofy outfit that looked cool on Tilda Swinton, but doesn't look cool on Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. Um, And he looks intense in the camera and flies away. Yeah, I also thought that was lame. Setting up a sequel that, that, not that I wouldn't want a sequel to this movie, but I don't want the Chaz Angel sequel <laughs> of the movie. It's um, something about the name Chaz makes me instantly think that the person is is like I don't take them, I don't give them much credibility. Mm. I'm not sure why. It's a very English nickname, right? Like it's British because he's supposed to be a British guy. Yeah, uh, and Chaz, uh, what is it? It's nickname for Charles, I think. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. It makes sense when he's a British cabbie. It doesn't make sense when he's a American kid. Anyways, that's the end of the movie. That was it. So uh, what worked for you? The visual aesthetic of this movie, I yeah. I absolutely love. I, I love the neo-noir style. I love, this is probably controversial, um, but I actually really like them setting it in LA because it gives you the the backdrop of the the sort of Chicano Catholic imagery everywhere. Um, but you're a known LA stan. I am, and I think this. And I is, think LA sucks. This is one of these movies that really makes LA a character and shows it in a in a way that I like. And I also like uh, the the upside down of LA. I like the hell of LA that that they visit. Sure. Um, and then besides that, I really like Keanu, which 
it was one of the things that was most criticized about the movie. Um, but I think that there's something about the character that he really captures. And, yeah. and I, I don't have, I don't have that much of a problem with them changing it in, in this regard, because I think he brings something special there to the character. Um, I like the way he moves and the way he inhabits that character. Mm-hmm. Um, the, he said that, you know, they gave him lots of different trench coats to, to try out. Cause the, the typical Constantine trench coat is like one of the more like the tan colored, mm-hmm. you know, classic trench coat. Um, but Keanu picked that, that black one. And he said, when he found that trench coat, he knew how to play the character. Like he knew with that piece of costume, how he was going to move and everything. And I, I really was, I really liked it. What about you? What worked for you? Uh, I had similar things. Like I really liked the style. Mm -hmm. Uh, The movie had a really, it had a very specific look and I thought it looked really good. I, I really am kind of a sucker for this era of movies when they're being made like the, that look that was late nineties, early two thousands. Like mm-hmm. I like that. That's those uh, movies that came out then just the style of the, yeah. the urban, I don't know. It just, it was cool. I really like the world, the IP. Mm-hmm. I like this, uh, this angels and demons and all that stuff. I think this is really cool. It would, you know, it'd make a great RPG setting, <laughs> but also it's just a cool setting to read about a character. Yeah. And, and I think, I just think that was really good. The other point I have here is good casting. I Mm -hmm. like Keanu a lot. I like Tilda Swinton a lot. I thought that, um, I thought that Papa Midnight and Father Hennessy were all really good. Mm -hmm. Even Chaz was all right. Oh, you even, Uh, um, even came around on Chaz. He's all right. I (laughs) I thought Angela was merely okay. Like when I was, I I actually looked her up because I was like, she looks like so many other generic Hollywood ladies. Like she's just not, I, I, I know that sounds so like, reduction reductive Uh because i just couldn't place her in things and she's been in some cool things she's been in a lot of stuff um but it was just like i didn't find her performance to be memorable in this particular movie okay i thought it was just okay whereas keanu and tilda swinton were very good okay um and so i mean there you go with that what about you what didn't work what didn't work for me number one baby Chaz, i call him Ooh. um I'm no fan of Shia LaBeouf in the first place, but I, you know, I already said this, but I'll repeat it. I really don't like this sidekick vibe that they gave to Chaz. I don't feel like it fits the movie at all. He's tonally in a different movie. He's in like an Indiana Jones or he's in the mummy. Cause that's a supernatural one. Um, mm-hmm. he doesn't fit this movie. Um, and I hate the tacked on reshoots ending that the, I think the movie has. I couldn't find anything that backed my theory to say for sure that's what happened. Um, but that ending does not... What movie did we watch that, that, that was totally like that? That vampire movie, The Hunger? Uh, was that it? Oh, yeah. The Hunger had a reshoot ending. And it was terrible. And it completely undercut the the message and the tone of the movie and gave a happy ending to the character that was clearly dead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's that same thing. Chaz needs to stay dead so that there's consequences, right? Because if, if, if when you die, you get a power upgrade and become like a, cru- a crusading angel, um, then, then it's cool to die and nothing matters. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. it doesn't need to have like a, yeah, uh, you know, we would have a romance now, but you have to go and take the spear. You've been given a quest to go and hide the spear and I must stay here and do my duty as wizard of Los Angeles. <laughs> Hide the spear sounds like a euphemism. <laughs> yeah, hide the spear in not the fun way that I'd like to hide it in the and you've been given a mission by God way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyways, I hate the tacked on ending. Uh, what about you? What what didn't work for you? I thought it was a little long. I didn't think this movie needed to be two hours plus. I think that uh-huh. not, it could have been a tighter ninety. I think you could have cut Chaz completely. Mm. Um, yeah. Honestly, he added nothing that would not, it would have been fine if Beeman was the guy who had the cool ideas to help him. Yeah, that's I mean, true. Honestly, you didn't need Chaz at all. And, and that's just one, not that I hated Chaz. I just think that this could have been a tighter 90. I think that at two hours, it's a little sprawling. 
and it didn't need it really didn't need that it's one of those movies it feels like you're hitting the the crescendo of the movie or the climax a little and, early and then there's 20 minutes more yeah exactly yeah and even in the climax of the movie it was like john was sidelined and lucifer and gabriel took center stage yeah. and that that was kind of a bummer but i think the plot was it the plot wasn't totally linear they did have a couple of twists mm-hmm. but the twists were not exactly amazing they were easy to predict yeah like gabriel heel turn etc mm-hmm. i didn't think that the writing in that manner was was really good the dialogue was good mm-hmm. but i really think that they could have done there could have been more done with this premise to make it more interesting as a as a movie just mm-hmm. from a storytelling standpoint so those are i i think those are minor gripes that yeah. they're a little long and the story was a little predictable um yeah so i thought i thought it was pretty good but I did have those. There was a couple minutes near the end where I was like, "Yeah, this is this is like twenty minutes too long." Okay. Um, so, so uh, what did you rate it? You go first. I want to know yours. I, I always go first. Okay, I'll go first. I really wrestled with this because I enjoyed the movie quite a bit. Um, I'll tell I, you this: I had a toss up between a three and a four because I think this is a three point five movie. So okay, we're on the same page, and ultimately. I saw other other counsel on it and I really kind of went over like the things that bothered me and thought about how much do they bother me? Is this mm-hmm. a deal breaker? And I went with the three and not the four, but it could it could easily go either way. I think it's a three and a half star movie. I think it's a three and a half star movie as well. And my own personal methodology is that Everything from 3.0 to 3.9 is a 3. Oh. And everything from 4.0 to 4.9 is a 4. Mm. You have to meet the threshold. Just like if you want to be the champ, you have to beat the champ. That yeah. kind of thing. If you want to be a 4, you have to be a 4. Okay. A 3.7 is not a 4. All right. So that's so I had to go with a 3. Um Even though I like this movie and I like Keanu and I would watch a sequel and I would even consider, you know, I'm not really big into the graphic novel thing, but if there Mm. were books like an audio book or something, Mm. I would really be in it like they did with Sandman. Yeah. I would be into that for Hellblazer. Hellblazer would make a really good audio book. Um, so yeah. it's a very literary, co- it's a very dense, wordy comic. Okay. Um, see, I've been into that even, even back in the day when I was reading Poison Elves, when Drew Hayes would do like a whole page of writing mm-hmm. in the middle of a comic book and people gave him flack for that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like this. You should watch, three. you should, and I'll pitch this to, uh, to the divers. If you like this movie, you should absolutely watch the Constantine TV show. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't seen that. It What's was, it on? It, I think it's probably streaming on Peacock because it was an NBC show. Oh, is it dead or is it? It's dead. It was just one season. Oh, okay. Um, and if you like this, you will like the TV show. I feel pretty confident in that. And, um, and I think probably not enough people have seen it because it's on Peacock. So only, yeah, only one you know, of the worst ones. Yeah. Or you can buy it on Amazon. It's not, ex- it's not an expensive show, but, uh, there we are pitching Amazon again. There we go. <laughs> All right. So let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and, uh, finish up the show. Okay. Okay, welcome back, divers. It's time for our final segment, the one where I ask Dave, what are you into right now? All right, so this is kind of a meandering story as to how, <laughs> what I'm into right now, and okay. I'm fairly sure you could predict it, but basically I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using some free time and I'm making a suit of armor right now, and it's taking me a lot of effort and a lot of time. So I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks while I do it. Okay. So... I've been listening to a lot of stuff on Norse mythology and North hi- Norse history. So I've actually listened to three things in the last week. Wow. Uh, I finished, I, I listened to the Saga of the Volsungs, the Poetic Edda. I've also listened to the Saga of the Volsungs. I just so, finished did you it like this morning. Um, sort of. I've qualified liked it. Okay. Um, I like it. I feel like he gives a lot of historical context mm-hmm. at the beginning and I would rather have it 
in between the chapters. Okay. Well so then, that it's fresh in your mind. Let me give you another recommendation. Okay. Also on Audible, uh, Jackson Crawford's Great Courses North, Norse Mythology. Mm -hmm. It's almost all commentary like the preface to Saga the Volsungs. And then he goes through a historical piece oftentimes doing sidebars where he discusses linguistic choices and other uh, historical referencing. He really deep dives it all. And mm. I'm about, I don't know, I'm about eight lectures in uh, out wow. of 20 some odd, and it's good. I <laughs> wish I had listened to this a long time ago. We didn't plan this. So I knew that you were listening to some of his stuff, uh, yeah. which is what prompted me to listen to that. But I didn't know you were going to have a, a perfect counter recommendation. Yeah. So I listened <laughs> to all three of his things on Audible. Mm -hmm. I'm not through the third one. So I listened to Saga of the Volsings, which yeah. is about, what, four and a half Only hours? Four, yeah, it was a quickie. Uh, Poetic Edda, which is like six hours. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, that has a uh, a, a good intro okay. like you would like. But honestly, the, the great courses, Norse mythology one is the best. But it's awesome that I listened to the Poetic Edda first and Saga of the Volsungs first because when he goes in and he dissects mm -hmm. these, I already know them. Yeah. So it actually makes the great courses more informational and interesting. That's and, good. and I really like that. Um, so I, I was really, I was really interested in it. And so when I'm done with this one, uh, I probably will listen to re-listen to the book, not by Jackson Crawford, uh, children of Ash and Elm, which mm. is a little less Norse mythology and more like uh, Norse history. Okay. Um, but I'm just sort of when I'm building armor and whatnot, I like to, I like to uh, have this sort of thing going on. Gets you in the right headspace. And you know what? And, and so that's what I'm into right now. But you know what I've been thinking about doing? And this might sound insane. <laughs> doing a full re-listen of all of the Song of Ice and Fire books. Ooh, with Roy Detrice. Yeah. Or, or maybe maybe I'll just do the World of Ice and Fire. I don't know. Maybe I'll do all of them. Everything. And the... What's the other one? Blood of the Dragon, the one that's just the Targaryen. Yeah, book. that's about to be a show. Mm-hmm. That's a good. It's it's such a good chapter of of the world of Ice and Fire that they pulled it out and expanded it to be a whole book. Yeah, I I, re I really like it. So yeah, I don't know. That's I'm, I'm into audiobooks. Have uh, you watched The Northman yet? Oh yeah, I watched Northman. Oh, you did. So, okay, so what did you think oh, about that? Man, that movie fucks. <laughs> 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 and that's on Peacock too. So <laughs> shout outs to Peacock for I mean, having Constantine and the Northman. <laughs> I mean, damn. It was really It's hard. Good. That's the yeah. movie's hard. <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. I'm gonna have to watch it again. Um it's very violent. It is. It's a grim movie. Uh, but, and and there's one of the things in uh, the Norse mythology, uh, great courses thing that where he just, he explains that. So you have to you have to consider the uh, old Norse concept of life and death was different than we have it. So mm -hmm. they believed that when you were when you were born, the Norns would choose the day of your death. Right, uh, it's predetermined. So it doesn't matter what you do uh you can't avoid it it's going to happen no matter what so for example if you're at a uh if you're at a feast or something and a man insults your honor you should fight him mm -hmm. because uh if you if it's not the day of your death you won't die right but if it is the day of your death it's better that you die in the fight rather than later on falling off your horse and breaking your neck right better to die honorably, honorably so you yeah. can to volhol so basically uh the day of your death is predetermined so so you might as well yolo <laughs> <laughs> And, and so in uh, in that book uh, it, or in that movie Northman, mm -hmm. it's very much like that. They're like, okay, we fight because that's what we do, and we yeah. know if we're supposed to die, we're gonna die. Mm -hmm. If we're not supposed to die, we're not gonna die. And so it's a super fatalistic point of view, and uh -huh. and it really drives their actions. Being being safety conscious is not a <laughs> thing. It's because it it's pointless, right? Right. What did because uh, uh, Diver Carey was very skeptical of the movie. What did she think? She didn't see it. I saw oh, you it. saw I it. By I went and saw it with uh, my buddy Marty in oh. Barrowlands. Yeah, you went and saw it 
on, in, in the theater. Big you screen. went in the theater? Uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know you went to a movie theater. Uh, dude, it's Norse, Norse mythology, North, Norse history movie. Yeah, I had to see it. Yeah, and so I was going to go see it by myself. Mm-hmm. And then I just, I just uh, figured, you know, I have a friend who is always down for movies. Mm-hmm. And so I checked with Marty and he was like, yeah, I'll go. Let's do that. So I went and saw that. And I ate at a food cart pod, which is something I never do. I wow. did things I never do. <laughs> yeah, good job. You went to a movie in a theater and did a food cart. You're living my life now. <laughs> I know, geez. It's like, this is shit I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what about you? What are you into right now? I'm also into audiobooks. We always double up on audiobooks. What the hell? Um, so a couple episodes ago, we did a Star Wars episode, right? Yeah. And we... Uh, yeah. Thinking about what I don't like about the prequels got me thinking about what do I like about Star Wars? What do I want out of Star Wars? And the the story that kept coming back to me was the first episode of Star Wars Visions, The Duel, uh, which is mm. a is a it's an anime um, story about uh, like a Ronin samurai that hunts Sith. And it's directed by uh, Takashi Okazaki, who is the creator of Afro Samurai. Mm-hmm. And that one in particular stuck out to me. And so I was thinking about that. And I was like, wonder what other stuff they have about this character out in the, in the world of Star Wars. And it turns out there's a book about him called Star Wars uh, Ronin, a Visions novel. And so I downloaded that without knowing much about it. And I really liked it a lot. Nice. Um, it's by a, a Japanese American author named Emma Mieko Kandon, um, and it's narrated by uh, Joel De La Fuente. And um, it's uh, I don't want to give too much away about it, but it it starts out if you saw the the anime short, it that's the first chapter of the book, and then it expands on that. And it's like an alternative history of Star Wars that's based on feudal Japan. Um, huh. So a lot of the he's a a former a former Sith Lord that now hunts Sith, but what you think of the Sith is really not it's not comparable to the Sith of traditional Star Wars. It's a very different, uh, very different interpretation of the Star Wars mythology that has more to do with feudal Japan than it does with Star Wars. Um, but it still uses, uh, you know, the iconography of Star Wars and the Force and and some of that stuff. Um, and I just really liked it. And um, just yesterday, I discovered that uh, Okazaki is doing a, a manga now set around this character, too. Um, so I'm into that. I'm going to get that when it comes out as well. Dang, that's... I mean, you sold me. I just bought the book on Audible. Oh, did you? It. Yeah, because I, I like Star Wars, but I re- I also really like, uh, you know, the things I like most about Star Wars are the things they lifted from samurai movies. Mm. That's my favorite part of Star Wars. And I like all of that mythos and stuff. The stuff I don't really like is the childish uh, drama and uh, like, uh, I don't know. Ladybug robots and, <laughs> uh, and uh, porgs and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So the Ronin is... novel sounds like it'd be up my up my yeah. Uh, let's see. Alley. There are kids like Jedi apprentices or whatever, but they're not prevalent. They Young don't ones. come until late in the story. Do they get slaughtered? No, <laughs> I'd, hopefully that's not too much of a spoiler. That's okay. The younglings are not slaughtered in this one. Yeah, I'll listen to that. I got some time. I'm, I'm going to the gym, so yeah, I really liked it. And um, you know, it's mostly positive reviews online. There was a few people that don't like uh, don't like that it has. There's one character with gender gender neutral pronouns. Oh it, no! Yeah. Someone likes to be called something that I don't like. Yeah, it's so weird in a world with, like, it's weird that the pronouns of a literal alien bother you, dude. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> it's not even a human being. Why are you worried about uh, its junk? Yeah, no, like it's Star Wars, so there's no fucking in it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's. I mean, and what if their what if their race doesn't actually have gender roles in their society what if it literally is genderless 
it's sci-fi. Is that really hard for people to No, grasp? I know. It's totally fine. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't like the people that whine about that sort of thing. So when I see stuff like that, it's like, it's like, it's like, well, all positive reviews except for this one. What's the one say? It's like, I don't like they, them bullshit. Okay. So Disregard. yeah, you, you read, you read reviews and you'll always find somebody that's like, this is woke trash. <laughs> and you're like, all right, bye. That means it's not racist bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So or weird. homophobic bullshit. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that sounds cool. I'm gonna check it out, and I'll let you. I'll let the divers know what I think about it. I'll have it done by our August episode. Yeah. And there's cool merchandise of this character too. Oh, so, is there? Uh, don't be surprised if I end up with a statue or something in my house. <laughs> so without spoiling it, does mm-hmm. what's this lightsaber like? Um. Well, it looks like a katana. So it's got a curve to it. Yeah. Okay, and that's fucking. He. Sick. Um. It's. Uh. It has a. A, a structural defect that makes it so it can't retract so he carries it in a scabbard like a katana oh okay so you get all the cool drawing your sword samurai moments okay except you can't put your thumb on the back of it when you're putting it back in the scabbard not really not without cutting it off yeah 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 but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of the it's like the kylo ren lightsaber it's a dangerous lightsaber yeah the one you're liable to hurt yourself with yeah for sure um so is it time for call to action i think so subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher as well as youtube spotify uh, spotify and audible we recommend audible enough you should get on there subscribe to our podcast give us a rating and a review five star review costs you nothing but means everything to us you new episodes of nick and dave deep dive the metaverse drop the first and 15th of every month all except for the 15th of july which we're taking off um you can find us on all social media platforms across the metaverse as at Deep Dive the Meta. We are on Twitter, which Dave prefers. We're on Instagram, mm-hmm. which I like, but we're still on Pinterest, which no one likes. Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. <laughs> <laughs>